Hello everyone and welcome to another amazing session in light of just one second. Open. Okay, great. We're live. Let's ready. Um, so my name is Yarin Waltzman and I am coming to you live from Costa Rica. I actually live in Jerusalem on honeymoon right now and going to be passing over an amazing session all about Kabbalistic insights into the feminine energy and how it can transform your life and the world. Now, that might sound a little bit loaded, but we're going to break it down super simply. We're going to go through a bit of more on the philosophical side, um, kind of digging into ideas more on Kabbalah and then bringing it down practically on what this looks like for your life, for my life, for the world, for the future of, of our people um, and everyone here. So let's begin. On my end, there's amazing slides. There's no way for me to share it over here, but I'm going to try my best. So let's start, perhaps I would say, at the end. In Ishia Yao, there, the prophets, there is a sentence that says, Vihi o alevana ke o and what this means is that in the times of Mashiach, in the future times of a world of peace and love and connection and unity, the light of the moon will shine as bright as the light of the sun. The question is, what does that mean? Who is the light? Who is, who is this, who and what is the light of the moon and who and what is the light of the sun? So archetypically when we look at the moon and the sun we know that the sun exudes light that is the masculine and the moon receives light the moon doesn't have a light of its own it only reflects the light of the sun so we know that in the times of the future and in the in the world that we live in today the sun's light is huge and the moon doesn't have a light of her own that means that the fire and the energy of the masculine is big, it's strong. It is the forcing energy, the leading, and the leading energy in the world, vis-a-vis -vis the feminine that isn't right now. But that in the future, in coming of days, we will have a world where the light of the moon, the light of the feminine, of the receiver, of the surrender, of all of that comes with it will be as bright as the light of the sun, will be not just equal to the masculine, but maybe even a little bit more. We'll see how that kind of plays out. But intrinsically, women are connected to the moon. Firstly, just even in terms of our cyclical nature, you know, just as the moon wanes and waxes, so do we. Um, and as well, Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, are the mashal is that that we are the moon reflecting the light of the sun refer reflecting the light of Hashem in that relationship we Am Yisrael are the feminine and Hashem is the masculine so if we look at the times of Mashiach and this prophetic sentence of, of Yeshayahu of Or Alevana Yeke Or Chama the light of the moon will be in the light of the sun if we want to start at the end maybe we should go all the way back to the beginning and where really does this first dance between the masculine and feminine begin, between the sun and the moon begin? Um, and to that, we're going to have to go all the way to Bereshit. And in Bereshit, it says that, on, that we're talking about day four, the creation of the world. So God created two great lights, a, a great light to rule by the day and the great light to rule by the night. Um, but what this meant was that both the sun and the moon had equal stature. And the Midrash says, it comes along and says, that the moon found this a little bit problematic because she said to, to God, God, you cannot, have, um, you cannot have two kings ruling under one crown. That means how can, how can my light, how can my 
how can the light of the moon shine during the day shine while there's while there's light outside think about it if you're in a if you're in a room that is all lit you wouldn't take a candle and hold it the light of the candle wouldn't shine in a fully well lit room right so the moon was saying how can we both how can we both and by we both we know that the metaphor is how can the feminine and the masculine rule at the same time and to that god who in whatever interaction it was said to the moon no problem go and make yourself smaller and what does that mean it kind of meant that practically we know then that since then we've had a bright big light in this in the sky which is the sun and a lesser light which is the moon um, and that really my my teacher and who I've learned many of these teachings from um, Sari Yehudit Schneider she teaches that as a result of this moon becoming smaller really all of the feminine components of the world and in the entire universe all of the feminine energy basically shattered <clears throat> and therefore like the primal drive of the universe is to put the feminine back to her place um, and really we learn from our sources that there is no there might be but a real deep and meaningful way to fix the world is by accepting the feminine by bringing her in and by raising her up um, and today we're going to explore how we can do that so really when we talk about this this isn't just First, firstly, when, when we discuss the masculine and the feminine, I'm not talking about gender. I'm more talking about different archetypes. And when, for example, you look at the story of Adam and Eve, that Adam, the first being, was created, B'Tselem Elohim, was created in the image of God. And God, we may speak to him in the masculine but really God is is it's not a he it's not a she it's it's not anything that I could that I could say but we do know that we have HaKadosh Baruch Hu Oshrinta Hashem and the Shechina the Shechina being the divine feminine presence of Hashem and in that way that duality of God is also within us that duality of the masculine and the feminine is embodied in Adam Rishon the, adro the androgynous being that was half man, half women, however you would want to understand it, but really that within all of us there is that masculine and feminine. And therefore when I talk about um, these things, I'm not necessarily talking about gender, I'm more talking about um, the archetypes and the different characteristics and, and values that are normally attributed to each one. So. Cool. So what is the masculine and what is the feminine? Um, I'm going to give you a second to just think, try think to yourself because it's not interactive. I don't know who's on the other side. I don't know what's happening. Hello. Um, so just think to yourself when you think about masculine energy and feminine energy, what, what kind of is that contrast and what is, is that dichotomy to you? I'm going to give you three seconds. Okay, that was longer than three, but so when we when we kind of look at it, the masculine is if we compare it to a line vis-a-vis -vis feminine, which is a circle. The attributes that are connected to the masculine are more. It's more of of thinking in terms of hierarchy, linear, logical thought. It's more of the faculty of the mind vis-a-vis -vis faculty of the heart. Um, the ma masculine energy, energy is more achieving, it's more controlling, it's more competitive, um, more intellectual. And again, we're not talking about men, we're talking about masculine archetypes. Um, and again, so if we want to maybe distill it into two main things, I would say mind, rational, intellectual, um, and hierarchical, okay? Vis-a-vis, -vis, on the feminine side, we know that feminine attributes are more 
cyclical, like we spoke about before, the idea of the moon waxing and waning. It's this rebirth, this recalibration. Um, the feminine is is more intuitive. You know, they say that that women are more spiritual, perhaps closer to Hashem, because we do have more of that intuitive, motherly, womb-driven intuition. Um, nurture, nurturing, creativity, creativity coming from the side of our brains of imagination, of, of and self, of, um, of art, and not of numbers rational, like on the masculine side. Um, and the feminine is also being. The feminine, when we think about Shabbat, Shabbat, the day of rest, Shabbat HaMalka, the queen, Shabbat. Shabbat is also the feminine. Um, and really, Shabbat is all about a state of, of being, of rest. Um, a day of, it's really a day of nurture, a day of, of being in the now, not being in a state of doing, rather being in a state of being. Um, and the feminine is also a lot more collaborative and and expressive. It's more this force of a uh, cyclical force of the oneness of everything being everything being connected and and really we see it in the cyclical nature of the world, both in terms of nature, in terms of the day, the sunrise, the sunset, the moonrise, moonset. Um, we have it in, in the week, Shabbat, days of the week in the month, Rosh Chodesh and the days of the month. We have it even in the year, the entire year in Rosh Hashanah. So there's definitely this cyclical power that we see in a lot of different places in, in time, in, in our outside world, in our inner worlds. Um, and that really is a little bit of what that feminine energy is vis-a-vis -vis the masculine energy. And I think that starting to see the world and starting to lead our lives both within us within ourselves within us in our relationships and the things that we do the way that we work the way that we bring ourselves into the world the way that we lead our personal lives our homes um, and the way that we show up the more that we can be in tune with these more feminine archetypes i think the more whole the world can be and the more we can really rise to a place that we want to be the question is, what does this even look like? So from my exploration and kind of how I came to all of this is kind of two-sided. On the one hand, I work with startups and tech companies. I help them tell their stories, raise money, do different things kind of in the intersection of business strategy, but creativity and innovation. And on the other hand, I also lead women's workshops in movement and into intuitive movement and intuitive dance. Um, and rarely I wear these two hats that feel kind of different. Um, both of them, I believe, and I feel stem from the same place, which is helping helping be the middle, the middle woman and communicator of what's going on inside and projecting that on the outside. If it's through the dance workshops, when I help women through their bodies move things that are kind of cracked into their subconscious and bring them out and express that. And on, on the other hand, when I work, for example, with, with startups and technology companies, it's really about helping their founders tell a story, bring out that vision and really take what's on their inside um, and bring it out. So that's kind of where I see the combination. And, the, and where I've seen all of these, mas these feminine and masculine um, dynamics occur firstly if we look at if we look at dance the whole point of intuitive movement and for those of you who don't know what that is it's just about being in a space safe space with the music other beautiful people um, and dancing from a place that is intuitive there is no you're not being told how to dance or what to do you're just moving and letting whatever come up whatever you have and however your body wants to move come up and and take over and what that is really is a letting go of the mind, of the rational, of the masculine. That's like, oh, I should be moving like this, or I should be doing this. And rather going into that intuitive place, into what does the body want to do right now? How do I want to move from a place that is beyond the mind? And using an embodied practice to tap into these 
this deep wisdom that is in within you that you wouldn't normally be able to get into unless there was a part of you that was able to let go of the rational, to let go of what currently is and to uncover and untap that light and all of that which isn't on the top, which isn't above the surface, but rather below the surface. Um, and that and that whole process is a feminine process because we're going again beyond the mind, beyond the rational and more into the heart, more into um, the intuitive. So that's how I see it really on the when, when I look at dance as an embodied movement and as part of, of what I do. And then again, also, where, where I see this in the startup world is when we look at the technology world in general, in the past, I don't know how many years, but like um, design has become such an integral part of, of the startup process. And what that means is that design really is that intersection of function and form. It's the intersection of the masculine and the feminine. Because if we think about the technological side as the masculine, and the more art creative side as the feminine design, which is that combination. It is, again, the intersection of the function and form. Um, that is where we see the small feminine design centric, everything to do with design really coming in. Um, so I see that in the world of design. In, I see that in design in the startup world. I also see that, um, you know, there's a lot of focus on empathy and managing management styles or, or not even just management styles but just hiring based on people's emotional um, intelligence and not just that but how how strong is their emotional intelligence and really seeing that oh my empathy gives me the ability to understand my user to better build a product for the end user to better to know how to sell my product because I know exactly what your pain points are because I'm connected to that that heart space um, that isn't within me and within you, and I can connect to your pain points because I have that empathy. That empathy, again, is that feminine trait, and that that I rarely see. Um, the third I would say is is, and and right now I'm just giving you examples of of how I've seen this um, practically in in my life professionally. But I'm gonna go soon into more practical tips in general and and ways of thinking. Um, for our lives and, and our world. Um, so, yeah, a third thing in the workplace that I see is psychological security. Psychological security is basically, um, if you're working in a team per se, you having the, you having the, um, not audacity, but to feel safe enough to throw out any crazy idea, because we know that innovation happens when there's a lot of just things being thrown out Innovation again. It's not. It's it's cyclical by by its nature. It's all about sporadic innovation, about different ideas. So when you're working in a team that has the psychological security, every person there feels safe to throw out a random idea because you never really know where that idea is going to lead to. But when they feel that safety, there is more of a chance that innovation can occur, and there's more of a chance that they can feel that they can bring themselves because they feel safe and they feel that they won't be laughed at and that place of, of acceptance of of in Hebrew you say like to contain like I contain even your crazy thoughts I contain everything because this is a safe space so creating that that safety and that psychological security is super important for innovation to occur um, and even when you look at the way that startup space just is like the, everything's open space. It's all about not having those barriers. There's no longer the hierarchy. Yes, maybe the CEO will have his office. Maybe at times it won't have a door, whatever it is. But we're seeing kind of that breaking down of the hierarchy between I'm the boss, you're the worker, whatever it is. So again, those are just a few points um, of where I've seen just in the world around me, um, both my professional life and in my teaching life, and they're all one. But um, really seeing how we're seeing even in even in the world, even in the world of of technology, that there is this rise of a new modality and a new way of thinking that I definitely think would not 
have occurred if it wasn't with the advent of technology and and yeah just just changes in in the way that we that we live and interact in general so before we kind of dive in to uh, uh, the last the last third of, of the session I want to just I want to just recap okay so let's let's just recap um, so that we're all on the same page I don't know where you are um, but let's just let's just go. Okay, so at the beginning we spoke about the idea that in the end of days, the light of the moon will shine as bright as the light of the sun. We spoke about how the moon um, is the fem is corresponding to more female attributes, and the and the male is more male masculine. Sun is more connected to that side of the duality. Then we discussed how. That, that that saying actually comes from Bereshit, and in Bereshit we have the creation of the two luminaries. We have the sun and the moon. The moon that had to, like Hashem said, the moon had to make itself smaller, and since then all feminine, all feminine components of the universe have gone and shrunk, and really our work is to allow them to rise until the end of days and really bring in a world where there is not not just a glorification of the of the feminine and not just a glorification of the masculine, but really a sacred meaning of both, a face-to-face -face meaning of both um, that we can only do really when we firstly start looking more at the feminine from a place that is different than where we have that than what we've done now. Um, and then we kind of spoke about the difference between the feminine and the masculine. We said that the feminine is more cyclical, it's more nurturing, it's more round, it's more about creativity, innovation, it's more about um, being versus doing. And that on the masculine side, it is more about the hierarchy, the, math, the, the mental, the rational, um, and that that whole dichotomy of the giving and the receiving. So, what does this look like practically and moving forward? How can you really embody this in your life and yeah, help help bring us to better days of days of days of love, days of connection, of unity, of oneness um, that we that we also need. So firstly I would say that, again, if we're looking at the dichotomy of, of giving and receiving, the feminine as the receiving is to, to, to be able to fully receive, one needs to be in a state of, of surrender. The more that I'm able to surrender my pain body, the ego part of me that wants to take up space, the more that I'm able to surrender that place, the more I'm able to receive. And when we look at how most of us, including myself, and I'm working on this very much, live in this world, in trying to create from a place of control, trying to create from a place of, if I'm able to do this and do this and do this, and that's not the way that we can, it, it might have been the way in previous generations, but now we're moving more of a place where we need to find that unity and close the gap between our heads and our hearts. What that means is that when we want to achieve, when we want to manifest, co-create, call it whatever you want to call it, but when we want to step into the world, into this world, from a place of creation that is soft and just magical and beyond our expectations, we need to learn to be able to do that from a place not of control, not on, not on, not of like just pushing ourselves into the world, but rather that of receiving. And what that means is that the more we'll, we're able to do that shift on the inside, the more we're able to vibrate on a different frequency from a place of the heart, from a place that is much more intuitive and change how we see things, change how we perceive things. And in that way, any, please God, anything, but what we want in the world will be able to manifest from that place of surrender rather than that place of um, that that place of control. And the way that I that I do that practically um, 
and that I see that it works is that usually I will I will set an intention, um, set an intention, and it might be of something something that I want to do, something I want to achieve, something I want to change in my marriage, whatever it is, um, and then really kind of give it over with a lot of emuna and a lot of and a lot of faith and, and prayer and then just be able to let go and really see how when I change my my emotional state about it, when I change my frequency, that is when things can change on the on the outside. So um, number one is definitely the idea of of surrender. Um, and I think that that is something that will we're all gonna be learning to the end to the end of our lives because that's that's a never ending a never ending journey. Um, and we have three more minutes, so I'm gonna wrap it up as best as I can. The second um, is a mindset of abundance. What does this mean? A lot of the times we live and we kind of think that this world is a zero sum game. And what this means is that in order for me to win, you have to lose. And really, we know that that's totally ludicrous. Why? Because we each come into this world with our own mission with our own set of things to do in this world and therefore that means that the world is equipped with enough resources and enough abundance for that to happen and therefore you know when you see this could be a work this could be a business but like thinking that for example if if she succeeds then i won't succeed or i know this is very prevalent like today in the digital age with like social media and instagram like jealous of other people's things like that is that is their success, that is their bounty, that is their shefa, and there is more than enough for me as long as I'm able to hone in into that place and, and bring myself out in the, in the right way. So definitely the um, abundance mindset is number two. Number three, I would say, and I'm rushing because we're almost done, is being connected to the cyclical nature of the world and of yourself. Um, like I said before, that there's a cycle of the day, of the week, of the month, of the year, um, and there's also cycles within ourselves, you know, we all kind of go like that, up and down, up and down, um, but really noticing, noticing when is the time to rest and when is the time to do, that rest is a time of being, maybe it could be Shabbat for you, whatever, however you choose to practice that, but really knowing when you need to stop and when you need to recalibrate and when you can continue. Um, and yeah, and the third, and on this I'll end up, is really intuition. And intuition is kind of like a muscle. The more you, you the more you like learn to, to tap into it, the more you'll be able to use it. So tapping into our hearts, learning to to just feel and to be in tune with what is with what is um, what is happening around me and having that internal wisdom um, and in that internal divine wisdom and almost having it like a radar and letting that lead you. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to wrap this up because we are almost done, but I did wanna say that this was lovely. Um, next up, I know you have the amazing Sol K, he's a dear friend and mentor. You guys are gonna love him, so definitely stay tuned for the next speaker, Sol K. Um, yeah, if I can give us all a blessing is firstly, dance more, spend more time. It could even be once a day, just put on one song and let go. What that will let you do is just let go of the mind and tap into the wisdom of your heart. Um, and in that way, you'll be able to connect to your inner flow, let things come up for you, um, and just tap into a different place inside of you so yeah a man that we will see the days where the light of the moon will shine as bright as the light of the sun firstly in our own lives and in the world Kulon. and yeah please god we'll see you all soon in jerusalem feel free to catch me on instagram Erin weltzman um you can find me somewhere here um, I also have a Facebook group. I have amazing workshops all over. Um, so yeah, connect. We'd love to hear from you. And hope to see you guys very, very soon. Chodesh Tov.